thank you for, for coming. And uh, they came yesterday and set it all up, and they're going to be taking it down after, uh, our, after our service tonight. And so uh, we want to thank uh, you and the men of faith uh, for doing that for us. Uh, today's sermon title is Going Public with My Faith, and it's based on the text of John 12, 1 through 8. We've been there before. We're going to get back there again. This has been something that I've had on my heart for a number of weeks, and it stemmed from the one Sunday when a couple of dozen of you stood up at the challenge of wanting Jesus to open your spiritual eyes so that you may see God, his kingdom, and then God's purpose for your lives more clearly. And it was a moment when many of you expressed publicly and unashamedly, maybe for the very first time in your life, a desire for God to become more than just the God of the Bible, more than just the God who you address your prayers to. You stood that day asking God to reveal himself or more of himself so that his word and his nature would become more clear, more vivid, more intense for you. You stood because it was your desire for God to be relevant or more relevant. We ask that if any of you stood seeking that from the Lord for the very first time in your life to let us know. And the reason why is, is that it's important that you fully understand the significance of what took place that day. Now, I don't know exactly why each one of you stood up, but this I know. You, in fact, did stand up. And because you did, it was meaningful and it was significant to you because it was you standing before God the Father unapologetically declaring your desire to know more of him. The importance of that moment in time cannot be overstated. For some of you, it may well be the most significant moment of your life. And we're here for you to talk with you about what it meant and what it means for you going forward in your life. So if that is your choice and your desire, please make sure you let us know because we, we truly want to do that. Now, the point that I want to stress this morning with all of you is any declaration that you make of your faith in Jesus is significant. And it's significant for a number of reasons. One reason it's significant is because it demonstrates the desire of your heart. And if you've been attending the Church of the Rock for any amount of time, you know how important the heart is. One of our most quoted scriptures is 1 Samuel 16, 7, which says, The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, one of the most difficult things that you're going to discover in your journey to live your life as a believer in Jesus Christ, and that is to live out daily in real life your heart's desire. Because if you're at all like me, that means that there are so many times you want to do something or so many times you want to say something that your heart is experiencing, maybe expressing your love in some way for Jesus, and you know it would be a blessing to God, but you find yourself for whatever reason not doing it. Anybody relate? Then the moment passes, and just like that, it's gone. And then later you find yourself getting upset for yourself, with yourself for not going through with it. And then like me, you start heaping condemnation on yourself and saying, I should have done it. Why didn't I do it? I should have said it. Why didn't I say it? You know, we've all been there once or twice or a thousand times. The question is why? Why do we so often hold back doing something or saying something that we're feeling? Something we know to be fitting and proper. A great expression of this incredible love that we, that we hold for the Lord. Why do we hold that back? For me, these moments appear all the time. These moments when I get a sense of being overwhelmed with just how worthy God is of my praise. And moments when I get overwhelmed, thinking how unworthy I am to be the recipient of his mercy, his grace, and his unconditional love. When those times come, I often feel I should be either humbly on my face or shouting his praise from the rooftops but often I find myself doing neither one. You know, and I'm well aware that expressing my love, the one, the, the, the love that I have in my heart, will bless the heart of God and quite possibly 
be a blessing to someone else. I know that, that this, is, this is good and, and that it would be a positive thing because the times when I have expressed my feelings and my heart's desire, it's been a win-win. Yet for whatever reason, I have allowed far too many opportunities come and go without seizing those moments. You know, it's so easy for us to offer our feelings in prayer, right? But to actually declare those feelings, well, that's, that's a little more difficult, even when it comes to God. It's really not a mystery why we find it so difficult to declare and express, even to God in words and actions, what our hearts are experiencing. We, let, we, we know that letting out these feelings of our heart about the Lord is good and right, but to get it from here and to get it from here, to get it out here, well, that's the dilemma. It'll help you if you read the seventh chapter of the book of Romans, because Paul explains that dil dilemma very well, and he says it has to do with the flesh. That's not an excuse, though, mind you. That's just a reason for it. The flesh loathes to be put in an uncomfortable situation, even when it comes to expressing the love that we have for Jesus. See, if I were to walk down here with a microphone and ask somebody to declare their love for Jesus out loud, orally, publicly, to just let everybody else know what they're what their heart is feeling. If I ask you to do that, or I come over here and put this microphone in your face, anxiety, right? Anxiety to just declare, even before God, what our heart is feeling. Why is that? I know every one of you, or the, most of you, are, are loving Jesus with all your heart. But to declare that, to speak that out, it's something else altogether different. Why is that? Well, I know why. Well, I, I might say something that makes me look foolish, right? I might stutter, or I might say something that people will think, oh, that guy's really stupid, right? But let me ask you this. If I were to hold this microphone in front of you, who would you be speaking this for? Who would you be saying it to? Well, I'd, I'd be saying it for God. Exactly. And if you were just speaking what was in your heart to God, your Father, right? And you were just pouring out your heart, no matter if you stuttered or you didn't stutter, you think he's going to think you look foolish? No. No. Of course not. Who are we doing it for? So that's why Jesus said this in Scripture. He said, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change, and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Little children aren't afraid of looking foolish. Come to VBS or shine and watch them when they're learning these movements with all these songs that they're singing for Jesus. They could care less what anybody else is thinking, right? It's not later until they grow up and mature, right? that they learn how embarrassing is, it is to sing and dance before God. Oh, people, right? Good thing David didn't think that, right? He danced before the Lord, right? Unashamedly, didn't care how he looked. See, Paul totally understood the reason behind why most of us balk at expressing our emotions like little children. He said this to the church in Galatia. Am I now trying to win the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now take a look at what he meant here as servant. Servant in the Greek is doulos. And it means 
not just devoted to another, but devoted to another, look, to the disregard of one's own interests. Servanthood. Serving the Lord is not just devotion to Him. It's more than that. It's devotion to the point of disregarding my own interests, disregarding how I may appear to other people. And it's here that one thing that we all as adults <laughs> are interested in, how do I look to all these other people? But listen, in order to serve Jesus, as he calls us to, to be a servant, doulos, we got to disregard how we look or how it appears to other people. See, going public with our faith is a choice. It's a choice every one of us have to make. And there should only be one factor involved with making it, and that is this. How do I look in front of Jesus? Granted, to get there is not easy, because you see, it's unnatural to not care how we appear to other people. It's unnatural because it's of the Spirit. It's not of the flesh. And what does John say? God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. It says we're people of flesh. We're going to need some help to get there. Now, God's help, obviously. 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power. We've got God's spirit of power within us. See, it's impossible to overcome the flesh without the Spirit of God. Amen? But God has supplied us with even more help because He's given us one another. Look at Hebrews. Encourage one another daily. See, Paul relied on the help of his brothers and sisters all the time. Look at he wrote to the believers in, in Ephesus. He said, pray for me. That whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the gospel. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Did you see that? Paul writes fearlessly twice. He, the great evangelist of the New Testament, was prone to fear in declaring and demonstrating his love for God. There's, there's no sin in being fearful when I walk by you with a microphone. That's a natural feeling feeling we don't have any control over. But what we do have control over is to take the microphone despite our fear and fearlessly declare our love for the Lord. You know, brothers and sisters, the vast majority of the time, God doesn't remove the fear in our lives, even though that's what we pray for nine out of ten times. Take this fear away. See, what I'm learning about God is this, that he enables us in times of fear to persevere despite it. That's what he does. I am here for you. I am here with you. Cast your anxiety on me. He doesn't just remove it. He says, no, we're going to deal with this. But you're going to deal with this with me, not by yourself. I believe one of the reasons Paul included verse 9 of Romans chapter 10 was because he knew firsthand that declaring our love for Jesus publicly would be Im imperative to living out our faith publicly for Jesus. He said this, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. See, those of you who stood a few weeks ago were doing just that. Just like many of us a year ago or 50 years ago, whatever it was, declared our love for the Lord as well. We, like you, won the battle over our flesh that day. Now, the answer we must all come face to face with from that point forward is, am I going to continue winning the battle over my flesh by living out my faith publicly? You know, since we've been spending some time studying the story of Lazarus, I thought we could use his sister Mary as an example of someone who went public with her faith. So here, here it is. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. 
Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Now, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Mary and Martha were honoring Jesus with this dinner in their home. Quite appropriate since he had just raised their brother from the dead, right? While they were reclining at the dinner table, Scripture says this. Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped her, his feet with her hair. Mary's heart was bursting with love for her Lord. It was obvious. But here's the key. Mary didn't leave her love there. <laughs> she didn't keep it in her heart, did she? No. She publicly demonstrated it. And she did it the best way she knew how. Now, here's something we got to keep in mind as we live out our faith publicly. It comes in verse 5 of the text, and it was spoken by Judas, and here it is. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Mary was ridiculed for going public with her faith. And listen, it doesn't matter if it was A.D. 30 or A.D. 2018. Ridicule is going to accompany any and all public demonstrations of our faith. We've got to come to understand that. We're not living in God's kingdom. We're living in the world, right? So this is the number one obstacle of people taking their faith public. It opens us up for public ridicule. But Jesus warned us, didn't he? John 15, 18, and 20. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. But Jesus also told us what taking our faith public would ultimately result in. Because he said this in Matthew, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Blessed. See, Mary received a blessing when Jesus rebuked Judas and he affirmed her. Judas, leave her alone. Well, let's examine a little more closely what exactly Mary did. Again, Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped her feet with her hair. See, this passage includes a monetary description of the perfume. It was worth a year's wages. Think about that. Didn't matter how much a year's wages was. It was still a year's wages. See, this was a very, very valuable possession of Mary's. Maybe the most valuable possession that she owned. I believe Mary's actions were affirmed by Jesus as good because she took something that was precious to her, something maybe that was the most precious thing she had, and she spent it all on the Lord. You know, one time a teacher of the law came to Jesus, and he asked him which of the commandments was the most important one. And this is what Jesus told him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. All. When you love someone like that, you know, money and possessions lose much of the influence they have over your life. See, Mary honored God by putting her perfume where her mouth was. We could, we could say how much we love God, but the true test of love is in our action. Jesus was honored. He honored Mary by her taking her faith public. See, after Judas's rebuke of Mary, imagine how she felt when Jesus just then restored her. And that's what Jesus will do. Doesn't matter how many times we get rebuked in public, right? God will restore us. So we see in Mary's actions an incredible amount of humility. And it is humility that is necessary. It's not just a good thing, but before God, is an, it's an essential thing. James 4 tells us, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. You see, it was a sign or a, a sign of honor back then to anoint someone's head with oil. 23rd Psalm, you anoint my head with oil. 
But the truth is, Mary didn't feel worthy to anoint Jesus' head. So she anointed his feet, which is very symbolic. It was symbolic because it was always the job of the lowliest servant of the house to wash the feet of any visitor that came into that house. Her public action spoke loudly. I'm not good enough to pour this on his head, so I'm just going to pour it on his feet. Huh. See, that's, that's us when we first come to know Jesus. We get this, our eyes are open, and we get this, this vision of who God truly is. We didn't know before, before the Holy Spirit came to to show us and demonstrate to us who God is. We get this picture of God. At least this is how it happened with me. When Jesus entered me through his Holy Spirit, I got this vision of God being this holy, righteous God, far more holy, far more righteous than I'd ever even thought of him before, didn't even know him really before that. And then I got simultaneously a picture of who I was in my own sinfulness, and you see that, that just that, that entire separation of who we are in the flesh from who God is. Wow. And I got to believe that's, that's how Mary saw her Lord that day. I'm, I'm not good enough to put this on his head. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stoop down. I'm going to humble myself and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wash his feet and that shouldn't be just a recognition we have on our, the day of our salvation or when we come to the Lord. That should be an everyday understanding. The holiness of God and without God, the sinfulness of us. You see, in order to cleanse Jesus' feet as she did, Mary had to first let her hair down. In that day, no self-respecting woman would be seen in public with her hair unbound. It was a sign of an immoral woman. But Mary obviously didn't care what she looked like in public to anyone else because, you see, her eyes were totally focused on one thing, and that was Jesus. Her only concern was acting on what her heart was feeling. Mary was the opposite of self-conscious. She was the opposite of people-pleasing. Exactly what it's going to take for us to take our faith public if we are to express out there the love what we have for God in here, then we can't worry about how we look to other people. In reality, all Mary was doing was modeling Jesus. Take a look. Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And you know what? Jesus was re rebuked for doing that too. Take a look. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. <laughs> Jesus has never, ever been ashamed to demonstrate his love to us. Philippians, Paul writes, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality to God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Taking the nature of a servant, do loss, devoted to another, to the disregard of one's own interest. See, Jesus humbled himself in order to serve. And in order for us to serve, we've got to humble ourselves. Humility has to take the place of our pride. Now, it's interesting to note that Mary's love for Jesus was just modeled after his love for her, right? God's love for us is an extravagant love. And our love for him should be no less extravagant. I mean, after all, that's the kind of love it takes to go public with our faith. A love where money and possessions have no influence. A love where humility is at the foundation. A love where the opinions of others matters not. A love where we give total disregard to our own interests. See, one thing that was so apparent in Mary's love is she, she possessed this through her relationship with Jesus, and that is this, an incredible freedom. 
Galatians, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Mm. Those who are in Christ are free. That's unchallengeable. But just being free doesn't necessarily mean you're living freely. Christ sets us free, but if it's the choice of everyone to go, it's, it's our choice of everyone to go and live as these free people that we are made to be. See, there's lots of closet Christians in the church today. People who are free in Christ, but yet live as though they're still bound up. You know, in a day and age where people feel free to come out of all various kinds of closets and proclaim their new lives, too many Christians are choosing to remain living behind locked doors, satisfied to keep their new lives in Christ a public secret. Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers, the old is gone. Come on, the old is gone. The new has come. You know, read one copy of The Voice of the Martyrs. It's a magazine. It's a ministry that, that we support. I, I left some of those magazines on the back table right there. It's of the persecuted church. And you'll see people in those, real people, in those magazines who publicly declare and share their faith in Jesus Christ knowing that it's going to result in severe persecution and maybe even death for them and their family. In Iran, get caught reading a Bible or holding a Bible study, and without a, without a trial, you're thrown in prison. That's it. You know, it's not a coincidence that today I'm preaching this sermon standing in front of a baptismal font. This water in this sanctuary today is the symbol of how the first century Christians went public with their faith. This was their coming out of their Christian closet ceremony. Baptism was and should remain today a public demonstration of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. It demonstrates that we recognize Jesus died, was buried, and then rose from the dead to live and rule eternally. You see, Christ went first to show us that eternal life is indeed possible. Baptism is a representation of our spiritual connection with Christ. It is us demonstrating that we have chosen to die ourselves to our sins. And by virtue of that decision, we too shall rise one day and live eternally with Him. You know, throughout the New Testament, when, when believers were baptized, it was carried out in full view of the church. In other words, it was public. After proclaiming faith in Jesus Christ, people were led down to the Jordan or they were led down to the Sea of Galilee with everyone watching from the bank. And then they were immersed in water. It was a way for individual Christians to proclaim that from this point forward, they have been marked out for the Lord. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You know, baptism is not a ritual that we, we perform that covers our spiritual basis. As a matter of fact, baptism by itself doesn't cover anything. Baptism by itself doesn't save us. It doesn't wash our sins away. It doesn't make us more holy. See, all of that is done by Jesus, by the blood that he shed on the cross. Baptism does, however, provide an important challenge to our salvation. Going through the experience of baptism by immersion can be seen as us challenging ourselves, challenging our faith. As Paul wrote, through baptism, meaning after we are baptized, that we too may live a new life. Now, I was, as many of you, were baptized as an infant. All promises to live a holy and righteous life were made by my parents. Difficult for a three-month-old to repent. I suspect that not many babies comprehend the significance of their baptism, although Katie says she does. Six weeks old. 
That's why you'll not find one instance of infant baptism in Scripture. The practice of the church sprinkling water on the heads of babies was adopted for the sake of simplicity. But in doing so, it changed the whole purpose of baptism. One important thing that was lost is that it eliminated the candidate of baptism from challenging his brothers and his sisters to keep him accountable to that person that he died to be. There are a number of organizations that hold ceremonies when new members are being brought in. Often pledges are made to uphold the principles in the bylaws of the organization. I remember when I joined the Boy Scouts. I had to recite the Scout Oath and the Scout Pledge in front of all these other Scouts and, and all these parents that were there. My dad didn't do it for me. Officially, I became a Boy Scout that day, but the ceremony proved to be more than just an entrance exam into Scouts. You see, when I recited the 12 points of the Scout Law, I was also pledging to uphold all 12 of those laws. And because I was doing that in the presence of others, I was, in effect, putting everyone there on notice that Reed Lamport was vowing to be trustworthy and loyal and helpful and friendly and courteous and kind and obedient and cheerful and thrifty and brave and clean and reverent. It was a pledge I publicly declared that I was going to make good on. And because it was public, and because that pledge was from my own mouth, that pledge also became my permission for everyone there witnessing this to keep me accountable to my words. Baptism by immersion holds some of those same characteristics as when I joined the Boy Scouts. However, one thing it's not. It's not a ritual that ushers us into membership into some church or some Christian organization. It's far more important than that. It's declaring that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Jesus Christ is my Savior. And I'm promising to live my life by the Word of God. And if I do not, then all of you who love me in Christ, all of you who are witnessing my immersion in water, have my permission to call me out when I fail to live as the servant of Christ, Christ that I'm professing to be. You see, baptism is a very significant experience. And I believe this service tonight is a very significant event in the life of the Church of the Rock. Is it going to become an annual thing? I don't know. Right now, I'm not too concerned with that. I just know that this is something that we're called to do tonight. And one more thing about what Mary did. She seized the opportunity to go public with her faith when that opportunity presented itself. If Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life, and you're not ashamed of that, and what I want you to do is I want you to consider, if you've never been immersed, to consider that tonight. I want you to pray about that. And I want to invite you to be immersed. You know, it, it just might be the encouragement that you need to take your faith more public. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, Lord, what a joy it is to read your word. What a joy it is to, to understand your word and to see the relevance of your word in our life. Father, my prayer my prayer is that we persevere through the fear that we have in our lives. That we grab hold, Lord God, of the promises that you make. Never will you leave us. Never will you forsake us. And we seize all the opportunities that you provide for us. They are among us all the time. Maybe somebody in our own family, maybe somebody at work or somebody at school. Just an opportunity to witness this love that we have for you. Father, I pray for the, the courage that it takes to go through with that. And once we begin to do that, Father, how much simpler it is the next time. We love you. We thank you. And we praise you that we have a God who loves us as much as you do. 
It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Would you stand with me as we close our service this morning?